Thanks, John. I have a question. Sure. <clears throat> so one of the things I appreciate is the forward thinking nature of what you talked about. So in other words, anticipating, you said more stringent guidelines in the future, being ready for that, building mm -hmm. things into the hub. Um, and then at the textbook level, you know, building this into the process so that it's not retrofitting a textbook by request, you know, after the fact. Right. So um, with that in mind, I'm interested, what kind of recommendations, if you could talk a bit more about what both authors and project managers can do at the outset of starting a project, starting their writing process, so that it is um, sort of built in at the beginning, what kind of questions or things could we build into the process to support that? Um, I mean, I have a couple thoughts about that and maybe Elvis would chime in too. I mean, I think it's important to know, I guess as long to know who your audience is um, so you can tailor things um, appropriately to your audience. I would also say, I would try to get the art settled early on um, so that you know so if, if alternate text does come into play, that that's something that can be done early on and, and they can be adequately described. Um, um, I don't know, Elvis, do you have any thoughts from a project management standpoint on that stuff? So I would say that, you know, just being up front right from the very beginning saying like we are trying to get this, you know, your book, right? And the, you can even phrase it this way, talking to the author, say like we're trying to get your book into as many um, you know, hands, you know, quote unquote, as possible. And that will involve, you know, having you think a little bit about somebody who is not, you know, who may not be able to actually see your book, right? And see the content that you're trying to provide for them. Because I think that authors, um, you know, they're authors because they feel like they have something, you know, important to say or is important to like share with the, with whatever community or whatever audience, um, like John described, you know, they're trying to reach. And within that sort of to blend this together with what Jess brought up during our guest lecture day, it's like, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible because if, if we start creating things, um, and then have to, Oh, now we, I, we, I got to take this book and add a bunch of stuff because, you know, somebody who, you know, has difficulty seeing, um, you know, can't actually appreciate or, 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 take in all of the content and then that creates an issue and if you tell the author that like right up front then they might come up with their own questions like well okay so then how do i consider um you know how do i consider somebody who can't see for example and at that point that's where as a project manager you would come in and say well you know like what we've just discussed today make sure that your images are not just there as hey this is a necessity and but if you remove this image none of the context context around it makes sense and sort of everything falls apart make it so that the images are you know assisting the content rather than you know the content themselves um and yeah i would say that that would be it like just going forward like being as forthright as possible with the authors right from the beginning and saying, Hey, you know, we kind of need you to think this way. Um, and I think that that would sort of solve a lot of things. And then I guess another question, um, you know, that you, that as a project manager, um, you can sort of ask yourself is like, okay, if the author doesn't do these things, where do I stand? You know, do I then go back to the author and say, you have to, or is it something that then, for example, during composition, we have to then take care uh, by adding, for example, those, um, you know, accessibility styles and things like that. And how much time is that going to then add to the project? Um, because if you think about that, then you can know where, where you stand with your, with your author. Yeah. So I would say, I would say that's what I would be coming up with. I don't know if Tim has something I don't want to leave him out either. Um, no, I think that's all good. And while we're talking about communicating with your authors and vetting, like we're about to talk about vetting a lot more, this is another thing to keep in mind while vetting. Is my author reviewing or writing their Word document expecting that that's the final product? Are they referencing page numbers in their Word document? Are they, you know, are they making it so that it's something that's going to be able to transform into a different format easily? Or do we need to build in time to adjust it in such a way that it's a little bit more, I would say, reflowable or adaptable. And then, um, Kathy, I see you have a question about sidebars having um, background colors for the text, other colors that should be avoided, some colors better than others. 
I can't, it, I think that it would be a very small percentage uh, of the overall design where it would be an issue. I think there are some visual things to avoid, maybe in terms of color blindness, but in most cases, I don't think of a color that's going to be avoided necessarily across the board. As long as you're thinking in terms of proper contrast visually, you're not putting like a 10% gray on top of a 20% gray or things like that. Um, so I don't think that there's any particular um, trouble area in that specific realm. Yeah, I would agree with that. And especially by the time it gets to the ebook, um, most devices have a way to toggle on and off um, the colors anyway. You can basically see it um, in black and white um, or in a sepia tone, things like that. So as long as it's, the contrast is adequate, I think it's fine. And I don't think you need to avoid specifically any color combination. I think Corinne had a question um, about where to add alt text during the process. So John, if you could talk about that. Okay. Um, I can show you where it winds up at the end of the process. Um, like I said, <clears throat> we're now going to, going to accommodate adding it. Basically, if you've seen the image queries in, um, in the SAI or in our workflow where you're basically placing an image in a, uh, a call out to an image in a Word document, um, that same structure is now going to accommodate an alt field um, where you'll be able to place live text um, this, we happen to be looking at HTML now, but it, it will have very similar markup. Um, you can basically place the text there as live text and you can edit it um, all throughout the process um, right there within the image query callout. And it will come through throughout the process. Um, in this case, in HTML, it's something as simple as you have um, an image callout here. It references the actual JPEG in this case. And within that tag is this alt field comprised of a, you know, a couple hundred um, characters that provides the alternate text. If you were to look at this on the web and roll over that image, that text would be displayed. If you were reading this ebook and had the read aloud turned on on your iPad, um, it should read that text aloud to you. So to answer the question is, <clears throat> it can be, you can, you can upload alternate text to the hub um, or apply it directly to an image that's uploaded at any time. When that image is uploaded, you can actually even, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Elvis, there, you can provide a, a, a text equivalent, a, a list of alternate texts that you can actually upload as a separate document in the hub, I think. I haven't used that yet. Um, that will apply to the images in your, in your project. Um, so with, so now that we're going to accommodate a docx, we're ensuring that it can be done as the very first, one of the very first steps in the project. So it kind of brings everything together and it'll be useful and it will be maintained throughout the process going back and forth. So you'll have it uh, when you need it. Right. And I think that's the question that Kathy was now asking, like, will the, um, will the text carry forward um, to all versions? We're working on that now. That's mm -hmm. currently in testing as John has, yep. has described. Oh, and it's, it's functional and we're just testing it and that will be rolled out. I don't know the specific date, um, mm -hmm. but that's been a challenge um, and we finally have a solution for it and we're excited about that. Because yeah. um, it's obviously uh, beneficial to have that alternate text early on and, and maintain it throughout so you don't have to worry about it. Right. And that way, as you're working on it, like, as John said, like the copy editor can even take a look at the alt text, make sure that that's copy edited. Right now, that's sort of a separate process where you have to sort of look at the alt text separately. Um, John is correct. I just want to make sure that. Um, um, yeah, maybe you can uh, describe that more adequately. <laughs> <laughs> Later, yes. Um, but right now, um, there is this short description um, sort of field in the images where you can put in the alt text or you can upload that list um, and it'll populate that for you, that description list. Um, so you can do that on the hub um, after you've uploaded your images and then that way you'll have your alt text there and it will carry through um, and then eventually carry through like through round tripping or putting it in during like composition or anything like that. Um, I wanted to add to this the, the fact that like just sort of to blend things together that on like John said in the beginning, it's good to get the images done 
like er, as early as possible. Um, why? Because in that way you can deal with this like alt text um, right at the right at the beginning. Um, so, for example, um, let's say you have your book, you have the manuscript completed, you know, and you have your images uh, set up. You can already go ahead and start creating that alt text. So that way you already have it, and it's not something that you're. It's a, like an afterthought or something that um, you know is uh, added later on um so it's always it's always good to handle that stuff sort of like our philosophy as you've heard like in these last uh, couple classes and in the class today is to get things handled on the front end i'll sort of hammer that in throughout the lessons so like handle everything as much as you can um in the beginning so that way it saves you headache um in the end um so yeah let's see I don't know if there's any other any other questions for John. You can ask John questions about EPUBs. He's the expert, far more of an expert yeah, than I mean, if, you, if there's any questions about EPUB in general, I'm happy to address those. And or at any other time, I'm always available. John, I have another question. So you okay. mentioned um, how accessible or accessibility can help with discoverability. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm I'm currently wearing our open textbook library hat and we've been thinking a lot about accessibility and it's certainly something that we um, are committed to in the publication process it's a little bit harder um, once things are in the library to sort of retroactively evaluate them so right. can you just say more about how those two things work together well when it comes in terms of epub um, that metadata has been developed to make them more discoverable um, and what, how I interpret that is basically if someone's look, if someone is seeking out through a distributor, you know, electronic materials that have alternate text, for instance, um, then if that's identified clearly and your book contains al alternative text, um, then it's going to, people will be more widely, um, it'll be more widely available to people who are looking for that and it'll be easier for them to discover much like just any metadata, which is why we stress um, when we're creating eBooks to fill out as much um, meta information in the hub as possible. And, and we keep developing that and we accommodate more and more. Um, it's important to have, if, if there's a print book and an eBook, it's important to list the print ISBN because then the print page numbers that are in an eBook will get synced up. Um, you know, there'll be a relationship between those two things. Um, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that adequately answers it, but basically, as much information as can be imparted in um, the ebook as meta information describing any enhancements it may have um, and every, every piece of information that may be relevant, it just makes that book um, easier to find for a particular audience that might be looking for it and for whatever enhancements it may have, um, just like metadata in general sort of to tie this up with project management that's also another good thing to think about in the beginning right because if you have um you know your bisac codes and all this other stuff already set up then that way when the time comes to fill in that data either on the hub or you know through whatever other means um then you already have it and you don't have to then oh no i didn't even think about what kind of you know uh, what category this book fill, um, you know falls into and now I have to go and search for that um, So again sort of that idea um, a lot of front-end work means a lot less, you know back-end work later on um, So yeah Okay No, I think we'll give a couple give a minute or two to see if anybody has any other questions percolating in their head that they'd like to share or even any any comments or anything like that, um, that would, would help. What are you guys doing next, Elvis? Um, we're this class today being the last class. We're actually doing um, project management, um, and we're going to do a little bit of vetting stuff, which is why we're discussing sort of like thinking about all these things. Um, pointing to that and then scheduling and planning and all that so um we we will sort of dive away a little bit from like the granular stuff about epubs okay. um but you know that stuff is there and it's it's, 
it's been discussed and it's going to come up, I think, for everyone when they, when they get to that stage in their process. Well, I was just going to say, even if there's no questions, I just want to stress that uh, I'm certainly available at any time to answer those questions mm -hmm. um, as they come up or to review anything. Um, I like doing it. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> feel free to, to hit me up at any point. And I will, I will vouch to that. John is a fan of asking questions rather than, you know, going <laughs> I like solving problems. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and I think Kathy does have a question. Like, um, okay. what is the difference, or is yeah, is EM different from I in accessibility? And it is, but I'll let John sort of. Uh, it is so. So basically, um, the way that I is interpreted, the I tag is interpreted in HTML is italic. There's no implicit meaning that differentiates that italic um, for when someone's saying like watch out or well that would be bold i guess because that would be strong um but there's no way <clears throat> it doesn't get differentiated between what is something that's meant to be vocally stressed versus what may just be italic um, i mean you could put italic tags on a head level um, for display purposes but that has no implicit meaning um, so em literally means emphasis and should be used so if, if you if you have a manuscript where you're differentiating between what's just italic and what's emphasized, that requires an editorial touch. Um, the emphasis would be reserved for things that would need to be vocally stressed, to put it simply. So when a read-along software is reading that, um, it would physically vocally stress that uh, material. So Elvis was nice enough to put an example in this file where he applied that character style um, so the emphasis here will not be the mathematical details. That represents something getting emphasized. If it just had an I tag, um, that same meaning is not inherent in the usage there, if that makes sense. So part of applying these, char these accessibility character styles is, is looking at contextually what is bold or italic merely for presentation purposes versus what is bold or italic because of the meaning of the word and how it should be stressed. And Kathy um, followed that up with um, whether they'll look the same. And I believe they'll look the same. They'll render the same, but. Correct. Um, um, yeah. Right. And as a matter of fact, they can look however you choose. Mm -hmm. the, the appearance isn't the important thing. Mm -hmm. The important thing is the underlying tag that has the meaning. Mm -hmm. I could take something that is emphasis and um, it will be emphasized by an assistive technology because it has that semantic meaning on a granular level. And I could, quite frankly, I could make it non-italic if I wanted to, not that that would be useful. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is it doesn't matter what it looks like. So from a default standpoint, yes, an emphasized word and a regular italicized string of text would look the same. But they don't, they're, it's, that's not something that has to be. And that's that whole idea of structure versus mm -hmm. rendering. We de determine the rendering. The structure um, is something that we apply. And that's why you see that difference between emphasis right. and italics, EM and I. Right. Like a good way of thinking about it is if I, if I took this file and I tagged it appropriately, I could just open it um, without having any associated cascading style sheet or any styling whatsoever. And it will display on the web, for instance, with a proper structure and things will get treated in a default manner based on what they are. Um, and it has nothing to do with um, what they look like. So we keep those things separately. Okay. So do you have any uh, other questions? Because I see them, I see them bubbling, but <laughs> <laughs> like I need coffee. <laughs> And like I said, I would stress that if someone has a question that comes up later, I'm happy to answer it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. John, I just want to thank you for joining us. Well, my <clears> and, pleasure. And um, just say to the group, you know, we're all in higher education. And so we're assuming that we share commitment to creating accessible textbooks. Um, but that is our expectation. And so we'll... Um, figure that out together and are grateful to have your expertise, John, and the Scribe team. Great.
helping us do that. Yeah, I find it really challenging and interesting. It's something I'm really, so we're always looking for ways to get ahead of and be on the leading edge of the industry and try to develop what that's going to be. I think that's really an exciting place to go. So yeah, awesome. We'll keep doing it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, John. I'm going to stop sharing. At the Thank moment. you, John. Have a nice day, everybody. Thanks very much. You too. Bye -bye. Thank you. Okay. I think that was